Great, thanks, Stephen. So I would like to welcome Larry Whiteside, Jr. He is the co-founder and president of the International Consortium of Minority Cybersecurity Professionals. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit about Larry's credentials. Uh, he is a veteran CISO, a former US Air Force officer. And he's been in the field for over 25 years uh, in multiple roles at the government, in, at the DOD, in financial services. Uh, he's really done it all. And aside from his, uh, his accolades, I wanted to share that I met Larry at a previous SANS event. And as soon as I met him, he welcomed me to come on over and sit down and hear about all of the work that ICMCP does. Because like you'll hear throughout the day, it's not, you need to get in the door, but that's not just enough. You need to find ways to highlight your expertise, to stay there, to feel like you belong, and to really grow your career. So it's not just get you in the door and set you on your way. So I'm so pleased to turn the floor over to Larry, who will introduce the rest of our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the introduction and the opportunity, right? Um, I think it is these types of forums that uh, we're able to have as a community that continue to share knowledge and, and help those who are both interested in coming into the field, but also those that are in the field, figure out how to continue to progress and be better. Right, so today I am extremely happy and blessed to be able to um, lead a panel of some of the most powerful women I know in the industry. Uh, I'm gonna let them each introduce themselves. but our, our topic is around patch, packaging your skills and experience. So I'm gonna let them introduce themselves uh, from top to bottom, so Sharon. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sharon Burgess. I'm a Senior Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer at BCD Travel. I'm very excited to be part of this panel. Uh, BCD Travel overall is a travel management uh, company. We handle travel for large companies that travel all over the world. Corporate travel, no one's traveling right now. I get that. <laughs> but when they do, uh, we're, uh, we help people get to where they need to be. Great, thanks. Denai? Thanks. Uh, my name is Janai Marinkovich. I'm the Virtual Chief Information Security and Chief Technology Officer for a consulting firm called uh, Tyro Security. Been in the security industry for the last 20 years, uh, 10 of which have been uh, at the executive level as a Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, I've worked for enterprise brands such as DirecTV, Electronic Arts, a uh, big cybersecurity consulting, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, uh, consulting firms uh, such as Carlo Guerra and uh, worked pretty extensively with artificial intelligence uh, and uh, in information security and uh, currently just kicked off, uh, wish us luck, uh, on an apprenticeship program or school for 20 students taking people of, uh, of color and women, uh, 20 students and, who have no experience in cybersecurity and then at the end of six months, uh, we're looking to be able to, uh, you know, place them into good paying GRC positions. Wonderful, wonderful. Jessica. Jessica with us. Okay, yes. Hi, my name is Jessica Robinson. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I was on mute there. Um, I am founder and CEO of PurePoint International. We work with CEOs and C-level executives to really help them think about how to not only protect their organization, but protect the data that they're entrusted to safeguard. Um, we work with organizations in uh, financial services, insurance, um, uh, advertising, and really helping them to think more broadly about the work that they're doing um, and how that connects to cybersecurity. Um, we specifically support um, with outsourced chief information security officer services, uh, but we do a wide variety of things that really support the maturity um, uh, of a program. And I would really say at the intersection of cyber risk, as well as uh, privacy and data security. So it's an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you. Great. And last but definitely not least, Stephanie. Hello, hello. My name is Stephanie Schilling. I'm known as Cybersecurity Stephanie here in the lovely Cleveland, Ohio. And I am a relative newcomer to the field. 
Um, I have been in cybersecurity for about three or four years, and I specialize in, you know, mitigating human risk. My background is in the social sciences, and I'm really excited to be here. Great, great. So, so I appreciate each of you carving out some time uh, to participate in this conversation. So let, let's kick this off, right? So why is this topic important, right? If we think about the topic of packaging your skills, right, uh, as a minority, as a person of color, as a woman, right, why is it important that we find new ways to do that? And I'll let, uh, you know, I'll pick Sharon first. And, then, and I want this to be a dialogue, right? I want us all to chime in and talk, right? Um, uh, because I think this topic is extremely important as we try and change the narrative of how we present ourselves to the people that we're trying to get hired by. You know, I think it becomes important to, I don't want to say repackage or your skills, but to just package your skills, period. Um, and, and why I say that is traditionally, and my, my, my journey has been very different and actually very apropos to this topic, um, a, a person with my type of background wouldn't have been allowed to be in this space. And so trying to find, at one time I tried to be like someone else or tried to, you know, if you do these things like these people, then maybe you'll, they'll be, you'll be in the place where they are instead of realizing the, the value that I have, the skills that I bring to the table, how they are varied, and being able to package that in a way that it demonstrates the value. So I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say the repackaging component, but just knowing the value and the skills and the capabilities that I have and make and putting that on front display, I think is what we as as women, or at least for me as a woman, should be trying to lead with more, or I've led with more in later parts of my career than the front part of trying to be like someone else. I don't know if any of the other panelists feel the same or if they have some thoughts about that too. Anybody jump in. Yeah, I mean, I'll share. One of the things that I often share um, in, in forums like this is that I knew from a very young age that this was the type of work I wanted to do. I knew that I, uh, that I wanted to do security. I truly felt like I was born to, to, to work in this field. And, um, and I knew that I wanted to intersect with technology. And, um, and so there were just indicators when I was young that this was, this was the passion of mine. And so um, as I grew, though, I became, um, I was confident, but when I got to college and I walked into my first computer science class and didn't see anyone who looked like me, my confidence just completely deflated. Um, and um, I, I ended up dropping my major after a couple of interactions uh, with people because I started to think that I couldn't do it. And so if you fast forward to where I am now, that I found my way back to my passion. I found my way back to doing the work that I truly feel I'm meant to do in the world. But I don't have that computer science degree because I ended up making the decision to not do it because I, uh, of a loss of confidence or imposter syndrome, not thinking that I could. And so I, I think that I don't think I'm the only one that's had this happen um, as a woman and as a person of color. And so I think that we just have to navigate um, our careers a little bit differently based off maybe some of these experiences that we've had that necessarily, uh, you know, um, uh, that, that happened to occur. Um, and, um, and I think as we start to gain more confidence and, and within ourselves and as we start to gain more experience, that is what helps to propel us forward for us to know that we can actually do this um, and that we, you know, that we can do what we, whatever we wanna do. And so I think that having, knowing and understanding how to repackage your skills in a way to be able to go for that role that you know you could be great for um, I think is something that's critically important for all of us to be able to learn and understand how to do. No, that's great. That's great. Uh, Janai, talk to me about, about your background and what are the things that you've done, right, to repackage your skills? Because I'm going to come back to Steph because Steph being new, right, uh, uh, I, I consider myself a dinosaur in our field at this point, right? Uh, having 25 plus years in, right, there's, there's, there's very few of us, right, that, that have gotten, you know, past that 20 year mark. Um, and so, Janai, I'm interested in your story and, and how you've done that and also what you're doing to, to help with this, um, this cohort that you're sort of building to help them do that. Because I want to come back to Steph and see, being one, you know, a few years in, what are the things that she's doing as well? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I did have to repackage my skills. Um, I made the mistake of believing that because I had been working for... Um, uh, what I would consider bleeding edge companies in terms of technology, that that meant that I was bleeding edge in terms of my skills. 
um, or the way that I had presented my skills. And I realized very quickly that was not the case. Uh, you know, so there's several things that I needed to do to sit down to quote unquote rebrand myself um, that ultimately started to line up with, uh, you know, the concept called purpose-based leadership. Why are we here? What is our purpose? What are our core goals as people? And um, make sure that the brand that you put together through LinkedIn, through your writings, through the lectures that you do, through the, the people that you take on board as, as mentees, that it all lines up to that core purpose and your core goal for being. Uh, so uh, essentially what I ended up having to do is, is sit down and say, well, what are the topics that most interest me? What are the type of companies that I like? What are the, uh, uh, you know, what are the things that ultimately inspire me? And then start writing about those things, start researching about those things, start doing things that caused me to fail so that I could, you know, learn from those failures. So as an example, I got into robotics uh, because I own a farm and the way I was going to solve my problem was through robotics, by the way, not a good idea. Um, yeah, blew, my robots blew up. Uh, I ended up solving the problem with the dogs. <laughs> long story. But what it did is, is it forced me to start to get outside of my comfort zone um, and, and start working with technology that I was uncomfortable with. Uh, you know, so those were just a couple of the things that I ended up working on um, and I ended up doing. Uh, and then how did I translate that to this program? Uh, part of the program is about how do you market and how do you brand yourself and what is your core purpose and what are your core values and what is your core mission in life? So that we can ultimately line that up with the type of job that you're ultimately trying to get because and i'll end on this um branding yourself is more important in this industry than it's ever been in the past uh you know so and you have to kind of start out from the beginning um you know marketing and branding yourself appropriately so um, it, it's absolutely a key skill to moving up and if you have any desire to go into executive leadership then you have to be a master at this Right. So, so great transition to Steph, right? So <laughs> Steph being, a, you know, in the yourself? early stage of your career, right? So, so talk to us about this, right? Why you being, you know, compared to us, the relative newbie in the space, right? How, what have you done? What are you seeing? What have you seen? And where did you get it from? Did you come up with this on your own? Did you, did you Oh, no. Well, for me, um, Larry, you froze. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, and jump. Oh, you, you, you froze. <laughs> I froze. But All I'm going right. to go ahead and jump right in. Um, if, if you Please. have any other questions, absolutely feel free to shout them out. Um, like I said, I am relatively new to the field and I have an interesting story. So Jessica, you said that you always knew, knew that you wanted to be in technology. Um, I never thought that I could or I would be. Um, I, it's so interesting because uh, in college and in, in high school and things, I was constantly surrounded, surrounded by the tech folk. I was in AP and honors classes. I was that person who I was actively discouraged to take the honors version of chem at my, at my college and then ended up tutoring everyone on my floor because I'm darn good at it. Like I, and yet still, for some reason, I thought that um, STEM wasn't for me, even though I was like editing my engineering friend's papers on a routine basis. And I ended up in marketing and uh, communications because I also love people. I love talking and I love um, helping others. And it took um, a CISO, uh, my first CISO, who came, up, who came up to me and he was like, hey, I need to talk to people. People like talking to you. And he asked me to um, build uh, to build a cybersecurity awareness program for him. And at that time, I was like, I have no idea what cybersecurity is. I've never thought about it. But it's been really interesting to um, to look back at all my experiences and to realize that I have been a tech person for the entire time. But because I did not fit the mold, I did not I did not think of myself like that. And it's been also interesting. Um, being new to the field, one of the best pieces of advice I got, uh, her name is Emily. She is a wonderful individual. And she said, be like water, that I'm going to find people who actively discourage me. And there's so many. Um, and to find the individuals and flow like water towards those who will celebrate and elevate and support me. And it has been so, so important. And when I look around in the industry, um, both in Cleveland and in the greater and the greater global industry, um, there's not a lot of people like me. So I, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be talking to you and, and, to, and to make these connections because it is needed 
for my soul as well as for my sanity to know that I can persist and I can do this thing. It's important to look out and see representation and to know that you can. Um, in far as the, the branding, I am one of the few people that I know who is in cybersecurity who has not come from the tech background. So I decided if I can't be them, then I'm gonna be me. And my background is marketing and communication. Um, and literally I walk into our like industry events now and I hear cybersecurity Stephanie yell from people that I don't know. So <laughs> uh, going back to building that brand, I think it's really like leveraging, knowing your skill sets and, um, and being willing to leverage them and to be who you are in that authentic self and to bring it to bring it to your work in your industry. Nope, that's, that, that's great. So I, I don't know if my video is frozen or what's going on. So uh, if you guys can hear me, uh, I'll keep going. Um, so you brought up an interesting point right there and, and you had a male leader, right? Sort of bring this to your attention and say, hey, um, I see something in you, right? Uh, th there's something that, that I want. So l l let me ask this question, because I, I do believe that it doesn't always have to be, you know, a lot of times I've heard female leaders having other female leaders as their example. Um, are you guys sound and reaching out to yourselves and, and you know, others to try and be uh, a, a mentor, right? Um, because I think it's important as we think about what this rebranding looks like that we've got our tentacles out there reaching out to others to have these types of conversations. So, so how is that going? And, and are, we, are we recognizing that it takes us all together and we can't be this gender specific entity. We can't be this racial specific entity. We've all got to work together to sort of have these open conversations. I mean, shout out to your mentorship program. I signed up <laughs> for the International um, Consortium of Minority, Minority Cybersecurity Professionals. Um, I signed up both as a mentor and a mentee. Um, and my mentor um, is, a, is, a, is a male gentleman and, um, and my mentee is, is, a, is a younger woman. And I think it's just great to have those connections and to build that community. Um, and yeah, I think that allies and support can come in a lot, a lot of different shapes. Everybody else? feeling the same thing? Yeah, I think one of the things that becomes important is an extension of mentorship is sponsorship. And in the example that Stephanie gave up, it's, it, it, that she provided, it was one thing to say, hey, let me help you along your journey. And another one to say, you, there's this opportunity, you're perfect for it. Let me put myself in front to bring you along. And I think that has been, that has been a, a great success for me. Actually, one of my mentors brought this to me, the, this opportunity to me to, to be a part of this. And so yes, I you did. have to be mindful of how, you, uh, how we put ourselves in front, also vetting and um, developing a, a mentee so that when opportunities become available, you can put yourself out there and say, yeah, I've got the perfect person for, for this. And I think that will be part of the way that the, that the industry, this profession will begin to change by those kind of forerunners going out and saying, no, these things need to change. We have a different set of skill. We have a diversity of thought capability that should be uh, part of these discussions. So, so let me ask a, a, another question. So In today's world of job hunting, in today's world of community, it's largely a paper process, right? So that, they, that still is the face of us when we go in front of this organization that we want to join. Anybody have any thoughts or ideas, right? Both as hiring managers and future and, and employees, right? Who may potentially, you know, work somewhere else. What are ideas that you guys would share with people on how to better package yourself in this paper process that we are unfortunately still dealing with today? Well, if you're applying for a specific position, you need to make sure that uh, not just your resume, but again, your, your social profiles um, map to the job in which you're trying to apply. Uh, you know, so, um, and that you're capable of answering, you know, the the, the challenges and issues that the company is having that you're going to be able to come in and, and solve day one. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, 
identifying that I think is, is absolutely key. Um, big networks, you need to start building your LinkedIn networks effective today uh, and making sure that you're connecting to as many people um, so that there's a chance that you're actually connected to somebody in that company um, so that you can get a better understanding about um, two things, their culture and their language. Every company has its own vocabulary and its own language and um, people feel more comfortable if you're speaking the same language. So if you know that company's values and you know their purpose and you know the way that they speak and the things that are culturally important to them, um, then when you get the opportunity to be able to speak to them, you're speaking to them in a language that they understand and, and uh, their comfort level starts to, uh, to go up. Yeah, Jessica, you, you know, you run a company, right? If somebody wants to come work for you, right, right? What are the things that you're going to be looking for them to present to you to, to come? You know, I would say, um, first off, is that probably really who they are and, uh, and how they present themselves and the story that they tell is probably going to capture my attention more than anything else. Uh, because I know what it's like when I was looking and uh, for not only jobs, but also when I was, uh, you know, really focusing on cybersecurity, not having this degree and not having um, kind of some of the backgrounds that a lot of other people had, I knew that I had a story to tell and I knew that I could do the work, um, but it had to be painted in a specific way to be able to show it, how it related to the role or how it related to a project that our company was focused on. And so I'm, I'm very much not I'm very much focused on the skill sets that they've learned and that they've developed um, on different projects. Um, and so I'm interested for them to, to, sh to share that information. Um, I'm interested to share, uh, to learn where, where, where they see themselves in uh, you know, 12 months to 24 months or even five years. Um, I'm interested to learn um, uh, what they're most passionate about and where they see themselves fitting into the, either the cybersecurity ecosystem or the broader world. Um, and I say these things because I've learned that even if I'm looking at a resume and they have, they came from a great university or they have that right, uh, you know, degree, or if they even have that awesome work experience, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that it'll translate into a particular project that we're working on. And so I really need to have a better understanding of who they are. And also I would say probably one of a big thing is their willingness to learn and their willingness to be adaptable to different environments and to be able to work on teams where people are different in every single way. Um, and I think I would say by far that is that those are the key things that I'm really looking for. Yeah. Great. So let me ask this. Oh, go ahead, Sharon. You look like you had something. No, I, and I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what Jessica said. For, for me, I'm always looking for someone that's hungry. I mean, you can take somebody who is willing, a go-getter, you can throw a project in front of them, you can throw a cert, you can say, hey, go figure this out. And somebody who has that zest or that willingness to learn and absorb, I think will be one of the most powerful assets that you can have on, on a team. And I think something also that was mentioned um, prior was there are some nuances or things that you can do to set yourself apart when you are interviewing, knowing the culture, knowing the history, knowing how the company has come along. You know, everybody's going to know, you know, you ask them a question about this topic or that topic, you know, there's going to be kind of a, uh, a standard answer for it, but it's that nuance or how can you distinguish yourself? Hey, I know you did this acquisition or you did your, your company is focused in these kinds of areas. Let me tell you how my experience aligns with some of those types of things. Helps to bring you along in the areas where you might not be as strong at first, but it can make a, a distinction as you um, try to go through the process. Yeah, so, so let me, I wanna take a little deeper stab at this, right? So we've all agreed that passion and fire and, and those things, having that, having this deeper love of the organization, right? But that's once you get in the door. That's once you're sitting in front of somebody able to have that conversation. We all know HR is a, is a roadblock for us, right? And so because HR does this right stack, left stack, you get a hundred applicants in, but they're only going to send you uh, 10, right? Uh, because they go through their process. Well, how do you get, how do you communicate A to HR as the hiring manager? Hey, I want people with this, right? I want passion. But then also as the, as the potential hiree, right, how do I communicate passion on paper, right? What are the things, and this is why I brought up the resume before, we've still got this resume problem, right, where the resume is really only showing the job history you had. How do you communicate passion on 
paper so that HR, who is this, you know, this gatekeeper is going to ensure that they understand it and get it to you as a hiring manager. So there's a couple of things that you have to do right off the bat because you're not dealing with humans at this point, you're dealing with artificial intelligence. So you need to make sure that you that your resume maps to the job that you're applying. Um, you know, so so at a minimum, you're hitting the basics so that the system picks up. Well, this person might ultimately be qualified. Um, then there's a couple of other things. Right, 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 right. You need to be able to articulate. You know, these are the things that I'm passionate about through your own writing, through your research projects. Everybody should be doing some type of side project or side hustle when it comes to cybersecurity that they're researching. Get that onto your resume. Um, be able to have a link that shows all of the Medium articles that you put out or all of the LinkedIn articles that you put out so that they can see, oh, I, it, it's, it's a good way to represent that I am passionate about something because not only am I writing about it, I'm ultimately sharing it with other people. Um, but the, the most important thing that you have to do is you've got to represent um, the, you've got to try and map your resume to the best of your ability to the job that's being posted. Otherwise, you're not going to get to HR. I also yeah, think that right. what Janai said, the importance of getting yourself out there. Um, like at this point, I am connected because recruiters reach out to me is that I've done such a good job branding and, um, and figuring out how to go ahead and to be known that um, tapping into that job, job market that's not available, right? And making sure that you're easily found and when, um, and by establishing yourself as an expert. Thinking about the hiring manager side of it, um, uh, have hard conversations. So when I left my last position, I um, was queuing up the, 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 the next role and I had some really difficult conversations with my CISO and my CIO about, no, this is how this should be written. And then queued up um, a woman that I think would be fantastic at the job. I'm gonna be honest that um, she was in our service desk, but she has just a wonderful skill set. And they were looking at me and looking at her resume. And they were like, why would we hire this? Like, why, why, why would we put this person in this role? And I would, I literally, this is so funny. I took a piece of paper and I went, you're looking at the wrong side of the resume. And I folded it in half and I went down a list of topics um, and bullet points where I'm like, oh, like you guys see this and you're like, I don't understand. I see these bullet points. I'm like, she's a content creator. She is a connector. She's enthusiastic. She's a people person. You want someone in cybersecurity awareness? This is the person that you want. And making sure that um, you can actually uh, look beyond what is on paper because we know that job postings are sometimes written a little bit problematically and to have those hard conversations mm -hmm. with the people who will be doing the hiring both um, the hiring managers themselves as well as HR to say no this is what we are looking for mm -hmm. yeah no I appreciate that yeah yeah and just the one thing I'll add is that I do think that hiring managers have to take um, and just from what I've seen sometimes a bit more accountability in this process so yes in very large organizations where there are over a thousand resumes two thousand resumes that have been submitted or more um, at really uh, having a partnership with uh, with HR where you are going in and you're the one who's filtering all of this where HR isn't giving you a set of resumes but you're giving them a set of resumes of who it is you want them to connect to, in order to set up appointments uh, in, in uh, interviews for you um, and every organization is different so there are certain organizations where this just may not be possible or depending on how the process is for how these resumes are submitted um, but I do think that this is important because ultimately the hiring manager knows exactly what they're looking for. Um, and so for them, for, their, for them to take, for them to have planned in their schedule, particularly for key roles, and particularly I would say for roles where they know that they want a diverse candidate to come in um, on their team, um, there really just needs to be more time spent. Uh, because I think not doing this is where, you know, we hear things out like women don't apply or there aren't any people of color to hire for this. Um, so I think actually taking the time to actually you know, spend time going through uh, the different resumes and also the, the core, the core think skills um, or qualities that you're really looking for, you're gonna see that better and quicker than someone in HR because you know what you're looking for. Um, you can just scan it, just like Stephanie explained, you can scan a sheet, you can see keywords that are gonna be more important to you than anyone else. Um, and I just, I think that that's very important. Um, and as I've had different conversations with leaders in, you know, Fortune 100, Fortune uh, 200 companies, um, these, are, these are also conversations I'm having with them, that they can find all the talent that they want, but it's also what, what, how much are they willing to spend time and in also investing into this process, the hiring process themselves. 
That, that's an important, very, very important factor. Uh, Cause I, I know as a hiring manager, we get busy and that becomes low on your totem pole of, of things to do, but it's, it's extremely important. So we've got five minutes left. So what I want to do is I want to give each of you an opportunity. One of the things I like to do is, is leave nuggets, leave takeaways, right? We've got an audience here, right? That is both hiring managers and both people who are potentially going to be looking for a job, if not today, maybe tomorrow, or next week, next month, next year, right? What is one nugget that, that you would leave with them that they can take away and hopefully be able to go back and implement? Now, I'll go in reverse order this time. Jessica. Um, as a hiring manager, um, uh, or I guess if you're a hiring manager, if you're someone here that's uh, sharing your, your information with others, I would just say if you're, it's a piece of paper, which story are you, are you sh looking to share? And what, what is someone going to take from looking at whatever it is you have on a piece of paper? But then also when you get in front of someone, what is the story that you're sharing? Um, and I think that that is really important because as you start to put different pieces of the puzzle together, um, I think that understanding what you're looking for and also what you're looking to share with others is, is really important to, to that piece of, of standing out. Thanks, Jessica. Steph? Um, to the hiring managers, recognizing um, that the gap is real, right? That, that, that the diversity gap in cybersecurity is real and that it's shooting ourselves in the foot because if we're only recruiting from such a small base, think about how many people we need in this field and how many more we could do, we could have if we, if we, um, if we examine our biases in the system that's already in place because it is getting a certain result. And if we want a different result, we have to look at what we can change to go ahead um, and to bring that desired desire result about. Um, to those who are in the field um, and looking for jobs now or later or are um, getting started, uh, trust your voice. I think it's very easy to look around and to not see yourself or to, or to ask yourself, who am I to be doing this or putting myself out there in the way that Janai and Jessica have, and Sharon have talked about, um, but to trust that you can contribute and that, and that we want you here and you should be here and we desperately need you. There's not enough of us, so please come join us. Um, and to trust your voice and just to, and to, to run towards the people who, who most support you. Great. Thanks, Steph. Janai. So I would say a couple of things. Um, one is uh, take a look at your 65-year-old or 70-year-old self and what is the story that you want to tell at your uh, retirement and what do you want to have accomplished? What do you want people to say about you? And then now take yourself back to today and then plot out how do you make that story real? How do you manifest that? And what's the first step um, that you need to do? Um, combine that with what technology and what that future world looks like. So take a, go to Google, look at, or YouTube, look at some futuristic videos. What does you know, 30, 40 years out look like? And what part do you want to play in that? take it back to today, and then what are the pieces of technology that you need to start learning and start learning them now and start building the hands-on experience with those and taking the steps that ultimately allow you to manifest that, uh, that retirement dream. That's amazing. So to, to add, I just did my first vision board for the first time in my entire life, and it actually changed everything about my forward path. So I, I love that. Um, Sharon. I think for the hiring managers, yeah build your build a network and do your own recruiting and then i think by doing that you can bring resumes to the table instead of just relying on your um you know the ai that goes along the the process to find candidates you can have a, a, a more um, curated approach you need this kind of talent you are looking for this type of diversity you're willing to look for um maybe not the person who has a computer science degree from this specific institution, but you're looking for this kind of capability. So don't be afraid to have that conversation with recruiters, but also pull from your network to, to bring talent to bear. For the, uh, the, those who are looking for jobs, you know, I think part of my own personal mission and revelation has been identify what you are naturally gifted at. It's like the gift that somebody, you know, since you were a kid, you were really great at this. And find as many ways in whatever job you're seeking, whatever job you have, to bring that into that natural talent. You will shine unbelievably bright when you do that. 
And I think it's important as you identify that is not to stifle or deny that talent, but to use it as many ways as possible. And so I think that that, was, that would be the, the nugget that I would give to anyone who's working or looking for a job, do what you do really well as many ways as possible uh, to be successful. Well, listen, I can't add anything more than what these wonderful four women have said. I really appreciate each of you taking a snippet of your time today uh, to join me on this panel. Um, I think you guys shared some wonderful information for uh, the attendees, and I'm hoping everybody was able to take away something that they can take back and learn from and implement in their own personal uh, journey. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sands, for allowing us to have this panel, and I look forward to the next conversation.